This is JSA TV, the newsroom for tech and telecom professionals, and JSA Radio, your voice for tech and telecom on iHeartRadio. I'm Jamie Scott Okataya, and on behalf of my team right here at JSA, welcome to our monthly virtual roundtable. We're bringing together top thought leaders talking about topics important to our industry in our monthly virtual roundtable series, so welcome. You can find these uh, roundtable series right here on our JSA TV YouTube channel, as well as on JSA Radio. It's the only tech and telecom podcast series currently available on iHeartRadio. These monthly roundtables lead us up to our on-site CEO roundtables at our industry networking event, the Telecom Exchange. Next one up, June 20th through the 21st. That's on Wall Street in downtown New York City. Hope you can join us there. More info at thetelecomexchange.com. Today's topic, getting right into it, M&A, reviewing the big deals of 2016 and some predictions that we may have in store for you for the new year. This topic has garnered a lot of interest on social media as well as uh, some top headlines lately. So with all this excitement mounting, let's just get right to it. Welcome to our live audience here today and thank you also to those who are watching on demand. This roundtable is brought to you on our JSA video platform, which allows our panelists to log in virtually from anywhere. And uh, today we're actually spanning the country from uh, New Jersey and Virginia all the way out to the West Coast in California, streaming live video feeds, care of our partners, the video collaboration managed service provider, Pinnica. So thank you, Pinnica, and let's get started. I'm honored to introduce our guest moderator and a really dear friend of mine, Rob Powell. He is, as many of you already know, the editor and creator of our industry's top blog, Telecom Ramblings. Rob has been a leading online media entrepreneur in our industry for years, writing about telecom and internet infrastructure sectors since 2008. And prior to that, prior to founding Ramblings, Rob spent about 10 years as a software engineer at Bentley Systems. He's also, we should say, um, a Princeton man. He's earned his master's in chemical engineering from Princeton. Rob's yearly and widely read and highly anticipated uh, blog on telecom m and predictions uh, makes him really just the perfect guest moderator for today, as well as in June, he'll be at our telecom exchange moderating a roundtable there as well. So Rob, thank you for being with us today and please do us the honor. Thank you, Jamie, uh, and welcome to everyone. Uh, in 2016, the consolidation train continued to roll forward as it has for many years now. Uh, we saw some of the biggest wireless providers looked into the content world. We saw the network infrastructure heavyweights getting heavier as they made multiple deals. And we saw some regional network operators backed by private equity adding scale within and adjacent their territories. Will we see the same kinds of trends in 2017, or will we see new trends take hold? Uh, with us today to talk about the M&As from last year and perhaps the ones to come in 2017 are three esteemed panelists. I'm going to ask them each to quickly introduce themselves. Rick, you first. first. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Rob, for uh, having me back uh, after last year. My name is Rick Calder. I'm the president and CEO of GTT Communications. We provide cloud networking services to multinational clients, people to any location of the world and any application in the cloud publicly traded on the New York Stock Exchange under the ticker GTT. Ed, you next. Uh, thanks, Rob. Uh, I'm Ed Mullane. I am the TMT editor for Merger Market. Uh, we have about 400 reporters around the globe. I manage a group of reporters, uh, three in San Francisco, one in Chicago, two in DC, and three in uh, New York. We cover everything MA related and regular charter related. Uh, with regards to the sector. And Greg, you? Thanks, Rob, and good afternoon. I'm Greg of Vertex Consulting. Uh, we're a management consulting firm uh, focused on the telecom space, but uh, really uh, almost exclusively on the wireless space, um, advising our customers on a lot of different things, different types of uh, acquisition transactions, but also uh, merger integration, process improvement, and uh, really just about anything uh, involving their wireless networks. Thank you. 
Um, so let's just dive right in. Uh, the first question I have for all three of you uh, is that uh, what deals stood out to you in 2016? Were there any big surprises? Rick, let's start with you since I know that you were intimately involved with one of those surprises. <laughs> yes, Rob, I remember we were on a panel last year at this time and uh, both uh, uh, GTT and Hibernia Networks were guests. Bjarni Thorvaldsen was uh, was one of your panelists. And at the end of the year, in November, we announced the acquisition of uh, Hiber or the uh, the announcement of signing the Hibernia acquisition. We closed uh, that transaction in January of uh, of uh, 2017, right at the beginning of this year, and are very much uh, involved in the integration phase. We think it's an excellent addition to our business, adding. Uh, fiber capa own fiber capacity in the Atlantic, uh, particularly the uh, new Hibernia now GTT Express cable, which it, which provides the lowest latency and most differentiated fiber path in the Atlantic, and the path between uh, New York and London. So we believe we've added an excellent team and an excellent set of services, and we're excited about that addition to uh, the GTT portfolio. We clearly, have other uh, uh, interesting uh, sort of acquisitions that have occurred, but uh, let me let me allow the other panelists to talk and share some other comments later. Ed, what stood out to you this year? Uh, I think the uh, the movement from AT and T into the media space has to be the biggest uh, 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 surprise to me. Uh, you have the largest uh, wireless, uh, one of the largest wireless providers. You have one of the largest wireline providers. Uh, they're in the business of transporting uh, megabits and gigabits, and, and now they want to get into the business of, uh, of developing uh, you know, content. And uh, it's uh, you know, in, an interesting step in the strategy to, uh, or how you define your strategy in this, in this period where you have uh, massive change in, in how content is distributed and consumed. And Greg, what what did you what stood out to you this year? Yeah, I, I think I agree. AT and T Time Warner uh, announcement was probably a little bit of a surprise. Although uh, you know they and Verizon have both been making uh, continue to make plays for for diversification, vertical diversification into content. Um, Verizon uh, XO uh, is phenomenal. Uh, a deal for Verizon looking uh, looking ahead. Um, and although it didn't happen in in 2016 technically, it was just announced uh, this past week. Uh, the sprint of uh, buying a large stake in in title the streaming music service I think um, I think it was a surprise and maybe a little bit of a head scratcher for some uh, but certainly continues that trend of, uh, of the wireless carriers looking beyond uh, kind of traditional acquisition targets to grow market share and looking at uh, looking at content for me I guess the biggest surprise overall was the level three uh, CenturyLink deal I didn't see that one coming at all but um, certainly, the the biggest uh, AT and T and Time Warner and Yahoo and uh, and Verizon were were were, were very dramatic. Um, what do you think the overall drivers of of 2016 infrastructure M and A were? Uh, is is, is I mean, we have the the move to content. Uh, um, what else is driving things? Is it economics and new technologies? Something else, Rick? Well, I I'll. I'll on to that comment about level three century link I mean one of the things that w we observed about that particularly when they announced it was that it seemed very defensive that you had two firms that uh, were both shrinking top line level three and century link effectively merging for economies of scale made a very major point about the economies they would get from the deal and I think similarly you saw the same thing happen with uh, uh, Earthlink and uh, Windstream in terms of their merger, sort of uh, defensive in scope in terms of the, the lack of top line growth and, and the, the view to uh, get scale economies to continue to save costs. So, um, you know, as we as we announced when we announced our deal, juxtaposed against a, a offensive and aggressive moves to actually grow faster in what we believe to be a very fast growing market. So I think you saw a lot of defensive moves last year. and It'll be interesting to see how that plays forward into 2000. And what do you think the overall drivers are for for for, for last year in terms of for other things? Well, clearly, you know, last year was uh, there defensive. I mean, if we're not growing. We need to basically get scale economies and save money and cost and synergy. So we definitely saw that. 
We also saw the completion of the strategy of unwinding what was, in many respects, a failed strategy for large telcos to go into the data center and hosting space. So we saw the unwinding, finally, of Verizon Terramark. Uh, we saw the unwinding of CenturyLink Savage. So, you know, I, I, I would hazard that we saw the acceleration of large telcos going into media. I, you know, I just wonder whether that's the front end stage of the next strategy and to see how that will play out over the next three Ed, what do you think the uh, drivers have been lately, and how are they going forward? Um, I think uh, you know the, the trend, uh, you know, the pricing trend, just uh, people consuming more, and uh, with ample enough bandwidth around, where you always have these very long-term trends, whether, whether it's Moore's law or uh, 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 you know the price compression storage, all that still weighs on a lot of companies. And um, uh, and uh, no matter what companies do, they, they they have a difficult time maintaining pricing power. So I think they're trying to find ways where they can either limit uh, the uh, revenue pressures or do deals to substantially or manage the cost side. Um, and then the other side, as uh, what Rick was saying with regards to the data center play, uh, space, you saw a lot of activity in private equity getting back into the data center space. Uh, so uh, Apollo, I think, uh, if I remember correctly, purchased Rack Space, and then uh, Rick mentioned a few other deals. Uh, and private equity has played a, an important role in this. So, um, uh, so, so the, the pricing pressure, I, I think, is still a big driving force. Great. Uh, Greg, what do you think? Yeah, wireless, I mean, in wireless, we've certainly seen a shift recently in the motivations of the carriers and, and the, the drivers. Um, you know, in the past, it was really uh, focused on market share. You saw Leap and Metro. Uh, you saw, you know, a lot more consolidation of, uh, of market share in wireless. Uh, but that, you know, absolutely shifted in, in 15 and certainly in 16. Um, we look at probably two key drivers. Uh, the first being uh, vertical integration, as we've talked about a little bit here. Um, you know, getting more into content and, and um, trying to avoid becoming the, uh, you know, that quote unquote dumb pipe, right? Um, and then uh, uh, I, I think the second thing is really in, in establishing themselves for, for 5G. Um, you know, I think Verizon's acquisition of XO is a great example of that. I'm really trying to posi position themselves for the future, forgetting about market share, but really uh, the, the underlying, uh, uh, infrastructure in the network, whether it's the the high band spectrum that EXO had or the the fiber footprint, uh, really positions them well for uh, you, you know a, a full mobile five G solution. Even though maybe a few years out, the focus has really been on on preparation for that. Great, thanks. Um, so, each of, could each of you tell us generally how the M and A landscape is playing out in your respective spaces this year, coming this year, in terms of what types of assets are hot now? Uh, what types of companies are the likely buyers and what are valuations like right now? Uh, Rick? Right. I, I just wanted to take one one second just to comment a little bit about the couple deals that we've spoken about, uh, ATT and their move into Time Warner Media and uh, Verizon, both first uh, AOL, obviously, as they bought in uh, you know, their pending acquisition of Yahoo. I mean, I think that this is accelerating a trend you know, towards mobility, as uh, Greg just mentioned, towards content. Um, it's interesting, it's diversifying away from the core business of providing networking services to, uh, particularly to large enterprises. So from that perspective, and we've said publicly before, we applaud those moves. We think it's, uh, you know, it's actually a very interesting move for them to move away from what has been historically the core of their business to move into what are somewhat unrelated businesses clearly very tangential to to mobility so it'd be interesting to see you know how that plays out and whether content and other content uh, becomes interesting i do think that the in terms of your uh, last question you know i continue to think that the uh, you know the four private equity and other players the data center space will be interesting to see how that plays out not not central to our strategy but will be interesting I also think there's a lot, there has been a tremendous amount of activity, uh, new business formation around the unified communications and, and voice over IP space. And so it'll be interesting to see how that, whether there's more consolidation or change uh, in that market, the more traditional hardware players have been struggling. Obviously, Avaya just uh, declared uh, bankruptcy. So there'll be interesting to see how 
that uh, uh, a service element of unified communications and, and VoIP plays out. A position really small in today, but interesting and very important to enterprises of all sizes. Great. Ed? Um, I think, um, you know, I think the question will be how Verizon may have to respond to AT&T's move, uh, Time Warner. Uh, I don't expect them to match uh, uh, a deal like Time Warner, but more strategically, if the deals they've done in 2016 uh, or the last few years with AOL and, and with Yahoo and then other moves into telematics, are they of scale enough to impact their, uh, their operating performance, or do they have to do something bigger? And uh, I don't think they're going to go to find themselves as a big content player. I think they want to be more of a platform player. And if they have to do something uh, uh, more along those lines, in an environment that could be uh, where we can have a lot less deregulation. So with the move, the chatter going around about a potential deal with Charter, and, and a lot of ideas have sprung up from that speculation, such as uh, maybe Verizon will try to separate its Fios business and then do a, a wireless and wireless deal with Comcast. Uh, so there are a lot of permutations out there. The Fios business, I think, economically, has been a tough business, even though it seems to be a very high quality business. Um, so I think uh, Verizon's response to uh, uh, all the deals they don't go on to provide the scale, or do they have to do something more substantial? Great. Uh, Greg? You? Uh, yeah, a couple of thoughts. To, to follow up on Ed's comments with respect to Verizon, Verizon's kind of a unique situation where they've got uh, really saddled with a significant debt load from buying out uh, the, the Vodafone stake. So um, anything they do, they really have to be conscious of the fact that it's probably going to be very heavily skewed towards an all stock or mostly stock transaction, uh, which could limit some of their options in the marketplace. Um, but, you know, things have really changed a lot in the last year or so, right? We think that we're probably from a regulatory perspective, probably this is the, the first time in recent memory that um, the government would entertain the consolidation from four carriers down to three on the wireless side. But it's also the first time in a long time where um, the, uh, the circumstances don't really lend themselves to consolidating from four to three. Um, Sprint T-Mobile, which made a lot of sense in the past when they were both weaker players, uh, T-Mobile certainly emerged as a much stronger player uh, and, and not sure they'd want to be, be uh, weighed down with some of the baggage that comes with Sprint. Um, so, you know, while the regulatory environment is changing, it's uh, the dynamics of the marketplace are changing as well. But, but I would add that, you know, there's the big unknown in the wireless space, and that is, that is, uh, a third party coming in, right? Dish Network uh, is sitting on a, a massive amount of spectrum that they have not, obviously haven't made made significant uh, steps towards towards building out. So they're faced uh, in the coming months and years with some, some difficult decisions. Do they uh, merge into one of the existing carriers? Do they sell their spectrum and, and just try and monetize it? Uh, do they initiate a build out um, or do they uh, uh, partner up with one of the, uh, the wireline carriers that, you know, whether it's a, a, a charter or a Comcast, uh, put that spectrum to use and, and build a fifth uh, national network in the U.S. So um, I think in 2016 or 2017, rather, that's really the big the big thing to watch is uh, what happens with, with DISH and their, uh, their swath of spectrum. Great. One thing each of you touched on uh, that the uh, regulatory environment seems to be changing or potentially changing this year. Uh, to what extent do you think that it changes up and down the stack in terms of not just the big wireless players, but lower down? Does it change who might buy who, who becomes interesting, or people can cross cross lines they didn't cross before? Rick? Uh, sure. I, I mean, I think uh, uh, M&A has become probably a more interesting part of, uh, of people's strategies at this stage. It's clearly always been, uh, you know, a part of, uh, of our growth strategy, and we would continue to expect to execute on it. Uh, we'd expect a relatively uh, a simpler uh, a regulatory framework. We historically have not been uh, uh, really hampered in much degree because we're a much smaller firm than some of the larger firms that we've been talking about. But I would expect people to think about it. Uh, I think financing will be, you know, continue to be available in, the, uh, in this market in the near term. So, uh, you know, I believe it will clearly probably accelerate into 2017. 
Ed, how do you think the regulatory environment will affect the broader market as a whole in terms of M&A? Uh, I think uh, Pi will definitely uh, be more flexible than uh, than under the uh, than with the uh, Wheeler and, and the Obama administration. Um, uh, I think there will be more openness for a uh, uh, you know a, a Sprint or a T-Mobile deal, but as Greg alluded to, you, you do have serious balance sheet issues there. Um, and um, so I think there are deals to be done uh, in the telco space, um, and maybe there'll be more flexibility with with cable and and uh, and wireless deals if they make economic sense. You may see more activity, you know, in the broadcasting space. Um, possibly maybe there'll be some expansions in with regards to uh, cross ownership in certain markets uh that that may be one area as well where you, where you see some benefits interesting okay prediction time what what predictions can you make will you step out on a limb to make for infrastructure m a in 2017 in any of the seg segments fiber wireless etc rick <laughs> Well, Rob, as you know, I love reading your uh, your blog every morning in your newsletter. So uh, you did have a uh, uh, earlier this month as who's going to be an acquirer, and uh, you know clearly uh, we think we will be. I think we finish somewhere up up in that level of that stack. So I think firms like Zao and others will be continue to be active as they have in the past. Um, one thing that that we did publicly is we've announced a, a sort of growth objectives. You know, I, I we put one out there to be a billion dollar firm. Uh, we said we'd get there within five years or, or fourth quarter of 2020, and we've alluded to our public investors that given given the availability and uh, scope of the types of acquisitions we're able to do now, we expect probably to achieve that sooner, uh, maybe significantly sooner than we had originally planned when we first put that objective out in the fourth quarter of, of 50. Great. Ed, what would you say is going to happen this year? Uh, I don't know if I have a Super Bowl prediction. Sorry about that, but I think you are going to see. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of stories from my reporters on uh, uh, TMT convergence and uh, industrial uh, Internet of Things. So I think you're seeing a lot of small companies emerge in that area, and how uh, Wi-Fi is going to fit into that, and and that is one major theme we're seeing. And then going along with maybe not doing big deals, I think we're going to see a lot more joint venture type deals, uh, maybe going along with the charter of Verizon news where they're trying to find a solution for uh, 5G, where maybe you're not going to have full mergers, but you're going to have to see a lot more uh, JVs and partnerships, maybe similar to what happened in the wireless industry when it was in its earliest stages back in the 80s uh, type of thing. And then one other thing is just the role of China, not so much maybe on the telecom side, but on the media side. And if we do have more uh, convergence on the uh, between media and telecom, what role uh, you know, China could play on? They've been very big acquirers uh, in, in the media space. Right. Great. So we'll sprint by T-Mobile or what? Uh, I, I don't think so. I think we're going to leave leave 2017 the same way we came in with with four major national carriers. I think we'll probably keep an eye on three major things. Um, you know, we've, we've talked a little bit about Verizon and Charter. I think that's probably a, a, a long shot, but certainly a possibility that we're going to watch closely this year if they if they try and react to some of the deals that AT&T has made. I think we're watching uh, AT&T as well, not for large acquisitions, but really, as I said, to button up uh, some of the infrastructure needs for 5G. I think um, Straight Path is a is a real potential target for them as you look at their 39 megahertz, uh, 39 gigahertz spectrum rather. Um, and then, as I, as I mentioned, Dish. I think we're finally we've been talking about it and predicting it for years, but I think uh, once the auction wraps up here in the coming days, um, I think Dish is going to get much more active talking to some of the partners in the marketplace or the other vendors in the marketplace um, about uh, about their options. So. Uh, I hope that by the end of the year, we'll have some clarity. Are they going to build? Are they going to sell? Are they going to merge? Uh, but that's those are the three big things we're looking at this year. Great. Uh, those are, are the, the, the big companies. Do you have any uh, predictions for the, the smaller the privately owned fiber operators and things like that? Any of you? Rick? Yeah, no, I mean, I, in some respects, that's exactly what we did at the end of last year and closed at the beginning of this year, looking at a a fiber operator that fit very complementarily into our business, and so we would, you know, we would opportunistically look at other operators. I think 
players like Zao and others have done the same thing. Uh, we're very much in uh, you know, the, the global networking business, much less in the metro business. So, uh, uh, But I, I do believe there will be other assets. I think in terms of the ones that would come up for sale, as I recall from the other blog you did, which, which company is most likely to sell? I think two or three of those uh, types of companies fit one, two, and three on your list, I believe. So uh, you know, I clearly believe that there will be continued consolidation uh, in the fiber sector of our business as well. Great. Ed, do you think we'll continue to see the smaller players be picked up as well? Um, I think, uh, you know, when you, when you have network synergies, you'll see smaller players combine. Um, one area we do have, still have uh, room for consolidation, not so much in the U.S., but in Europe, is in the data center space. I think there are a lot of opportunities uh, for convergence there, and people have worked on deals uh, the last few years in the United States are turning their attention to Europe this year. So interaction is there that uh, you know, people are wondering where they'll find a home. And I think you have a lot of small players throughout Europe that can also provide. So I think there'll be some attention in the data space there this year. Right. And uh, Greg, anything else? Yeah, I think, I think um, one company to watch this in the coming years is Crown Castle. Uh, you know, not a traditional fiber player, not a traditional wireless player, um, but kind of straddles between the two, right? So any metro fiber networks that 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 um, fit the wireless carrier needs, all sales, DAS, or even you know, for IoT needs, I think Crown's probably going to be a pretty aggressive acquirer in the marketplace and looking at those assets to see how they can fit into uh, converged infrastructure. So I'd keep a good uh, close eye on them. I will as well. That's all the questions here. Thank you, Rick, Ed, and Greg for giving us your views on, on M&A past, present, and future. And I'll hand the podium back to Jamie now. Jamie? Um, thank you, Rob, for moderating our roundtable um, on telecom M&A. Thank you to our esteemed panelists. Again, Rick Calder, CEO of GTT, Ed Moulin, TMT editor of Merger Market, and Greg Weiner, co-founder of Vertex. Thank you, gentlemen, for your thoughtful insights and predictions on the deal shaping our industry today and potentially tomorrow. Rob, we also look forward to hearing you live in about 140 days from now at the CEO <laughs> Roundtable on IoT at Telecom Exchange, New York City, June 20th through the 21st at Cipriani Wall Street. Thank you, audience, for joining us. If you want to see this and other monthly virtual roundtables, including the one from last January with Rick and Rob and Bjarni, uh, we definitely recommend you go ahead and check it out at jamiescotto.com. Um, you can also find more information about Telecom Exchange at thetelecomexchange.com. And if you'd like your C-Level to be featured here next time, go ahead and email us at pr at jamiescotto.com. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Super appreciate it. JSA TV, the newsroom for tech and telecom professionals, as well as JSA Radio your voice for tech and telecom on iHeartRadio. Until next time, happy networking.